On the Majority Report, on the phone, Dennis Lewicki, who has been involved in managing and facilitating social justice and development for almost 45 years, works with community groups, uh, government agencies to address issues of poverty, homelessness, and discrimination, uh, and author of Magnificent Fight, the Winnipeg General Strike. Uh, Dennis, welcome to the program. Good to hear from you. Uh, So, all right, so we are... um, uh, today's the 100th anniversary, is that correct? Absolutely. May 15th, 1919, uh, all the action started. All right. Well, I mean, let's just start just briefly, and I want to circle back to this and, 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 and tease it out more. But briefly, w- sure. why, why is it important for us to uh, remember this strike? You know, I'm not a historian. I'm a, a journalist by training and activist by inclination. But I think that what history gives us is it's it's a it's a prism through which we can see ourselves today. And the 1919 strike was a struggle for social justice, for human rights. So by looking back at it, I think we can see some of the dynamics in our own society, our own time and how we're relating to them. So I think it's a useful tool. Of course, it's not um, a blueprint. We don't get a blueprint from history, but it helps us understand. And especially when we're doing anything that requires collective thinking, you know, it helps uh, a group. For example, I do a lot of work with young people, high school students, and it doesn't take them long to draw the links between the past and the present and then the discussions about the present. And I think that's where history and especially the strike in our case, is a really dynamic. It's a great resource. All right, let's talk a little bit about, just so that folks get a sense of of, of Winnipeg. It is a city now, I, I'd say probably about the size of like um, a Seattle. About a million. Uh, yeah, about a million population oh, now. Oh, a million, okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So, all right, and so uh, tell us a little bit about what Winnipeg was like uh, 100 years ago. Winnipeg, uh, at one point, uh, was the third biggest city in Canada, and it actually was called the Chicago of the North because of the amount of uh, grain that was traded through the grain exchange. So in both, between 1900 and 1920, it was a booming place. I mean, the population grew from 40,000 in 1900 to almost 180,000 20 years later. And it was um, a real agricultural and industrial center. Three railroads converged here. There were uh, 13 banks, um, the grain exchange, uh, the uh, industries, metal working industries, huge steel production uh, for the, um, for the uh, construction of big buildings. At one time, there were 13 what we call, or what people call skyscrapers at the time. And one of them, that was built in 1906, was the, considered the tallest building in the British Empire. So these are just indicators of uh, an economy that was really, really growing fast and, and um, really involving a lot of new people. So a lot of those thousands uh, of growth, they were immigrants. They were people coming from uh, uh, Britain, the United Kingdom, and Eastern Europe, uh, to work in the industries or to uh, work in agriculture. So uh, there was a huge influx of immigrants that really was changing not only the economic and labor relations uh, situation, but was really uh, affecting the, the cultural character of the, of the time. So it was really a dynamic time. For most, it was an exciting time. For some, it was bringing about change that was uh, a threat. So it was it was it was good for, for in many ways, but it also created stresses and strains on the uh, society at the time. <laughs> okay, and so you mentioned that um, uh, it was renowned for having a, uh, a skyscraper, and yes. the strikes um, uh, started at least in part with some of those construction uh, workers. Uh, tell us what, what, yeah. what led up to the strike. Well, there were two real key groups at the time that uh, were negotiating uh, for better wages and uh, uh, working reduced working hours. And that was people working in the construction trades, electricians, carpenters, that kind of 
uh, skilled uh, tradesmen. And then on the other side, there were the metal trades uh, workers, uh, tinsmith, uh, boiler makers. These two groups were negotiating with their employers at the time. And uh, mainly it was around wages. But if you remember, at that time, um, it was uh, eight to ten hour days and six day weeks. It was you know, nothing like we have today. So they were always trying to negotiate better working conditions and benefits for workers. The employers were very resistant to that. And at that time, remember that the unions were not formally or legally recognized. So there was a very informal relationship between the unions and the employers. So on one hand, uh, for example, in the construction trades, the contractors, the big construction companies that were building those buildings, they knew that they had to pay more. They agreed that uh, workers were not getting paid much. Um, there was um, uh, a time when, uh, during the First World War when wages were, in effect, frozen as part of the national response to the war effort. So the employers, in some cases, knew there had to be improvements and increased wages, but there were disagreements over how much and, and w- when to apply these changes. So... It was, a, 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 like I say, a dynamic time, lots of construction, lots of uh, work being done, but it was a situation where the workers were expecting uh, more out of uh, their labor at the time. All right, and so and uh, so, give us a sense of, I mean, it, it's interesting. It, so the dynamic, from a, almost a generic sense, is a situation where the workers are aware of just how much um those owning these companies and presumably the growth of who are benefiting, the capitalists who are benefiting from the uh, the growth of the city, and this is building resentment. Um, get, w- walk us through yes. um, uh, how, you know, who went on strike first, how this thing okay. spread. But I'm also curious at this point, because in the States at this time, uh, particularly 1919 in many respects, and certainly in 1920, um, there's a lot of rather, you know, famous, like uh, Maitwan was in uh, the States. I think it was maybe 1920. Um, there were uh, there was a lot of striking that was going around, particularly uh, through the, the 19 teens, uh, the, or at least in the earlier part. So how much how much were the unions in Canada what, what was their relationship with the unions, um, or I should say, you know, the, the workers uh, in yes. the States? Good. I'm glad you brought that up, because prior to the strike, there was a lot of labor action in the States and in Europe. This was a, a global uh, uh, phenomenon where unions were organizing, you know, in the, in the 1880s and 1890s, a lot of the workers were organizing into unions both in Canada and the United States. Um, So they were uh, really developing and testing their their union muscle at the time. And uh, there was resistance, obviously, from employers. Uh, They wanted to control wages and control workers. So it was uh, a time when there were thousands of strikes. Um, Even in Europe, going back to like 1906, 1907, Belgium, Spain, there were major, major strikes. Um, uh, the uh, the um, Russians, you know, before they took power in 1917, they were using general strikes as a way of putting pressure on the uh, government at the time. So, you know, it was a, 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 you know, a pretty universal phenomenon. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned, um, you know, Seattle in January of 1919 had a huge strike. 65,000 workers went off for a week, and it in many ways was a template for what happened here in Winnipeg. So just as you to respond to your question about how it all got launched here, the, uh, the metal trades and the construction trades workers were uh, negotiating in March and April, not getting very far. So both of those went on strike on May 1st and May 2nd of 1919. That really was the catalyst. There was a strike. They were pushing for wages. Uh, and reduced hours, they went on strike. That then uh, got the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, which represented other unions in the city, to then call for a vote on whether or not they would support those 
workers on on strike, well, the response was overwhelming. 11,000 or around 8,000 members voted to go on a general strike. Only about 600 voted not to go on a general strike. So right from the beginning, you can see there was a lot of union solidarity uh, and and in common interest, of course, uh, at the time. That then brought out uh, roughly another 12,000 workers or 18,000 workers. And as I said earlier, a population of about 180,000. So you had 10, 10% of the population on strike on May the 15th, 1919, 100 years ago today. The other interesting fact or phenomenon was that within a few days, another 12,000 workers who were not unionized went on strike. They were immigrants largely working in small businesses, um, some of them uh, uh, you know, domestic servants, for example, in, in the homes of the uh, city's rich, and they basically walked off their jobs as well. So that surprised everyone, but what it meant was that there was now 30,000 workers on strike in a city of 180,000. And just to add to another dimension, so we're talking numbers, the veterans who were coming back to Canada from the First World War, they saw, a lot of them saw common cause with the strikers. I mean, they wanted jobs. They wanted to be treated fairly. They had just sacrificed a lot in, in the name of democracy, and they already wanted to enjoy the fruits of that democracy. So about another four or 5,000 veterans got involved. So within a, a few days after May 15th, there was almost 35,000 workers on strike, and they carried through that that uh, labor action for six weeks. And so, you're, I mean, you're talking about almost 20% of the population, and I would imagine much higher figure relative to the working age population, right? Because we're, we're not, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, and, and so... Um, that has devastating effects. I'm curious about this dynamic before we get to, you know, how this ends um, and what happens over those six weeks. But the the idea that you'd have 12,000 non-union workers uh, join the the union strikes, the idea that you had four to four to five thousand veterans who are obviously, you know, sort of uh, I would imagine they still have particularly close bonds, particularly at that time, having just come back from the war. So there's a, a tremendous amount of solidarity amongst the veterans. There yeah. is in this country now, and I imagine uh, there's some maybe analog in Canada, although I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know, uh, a movement amongst unions that uh, are trying to turn away from the managerial unionism that has dominated the union movement over the past, um, I don't know, four, five, six, six decades, decades. Um, yeah. and uh, move towards a uh, more of a social justice unionism, which, um, you know, as in broad swaths, basically means that um, you uh, as a union, you don't just fight for your own uh, wages and your own job. You fight for issues. You, you, you create solidarity across uh, society by picking up and, um, and and fighting for the issues that are shared by folks in um, uh, the working class and shared by folks um, uh, across you know some amount of classes yes. the the yes. non-capitalist class let's let's put it that way yes. and yeah. so how much of like well, what was what was the consciousness of 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 how the approach was taking at that time? I mean, if the if the unions were able to mobilize twelve thousand non union workers, which is, you know, more, the I mean, almost you know, almost the same amount of unionized workers, maybe a little bit less, uh, but right. in total with the veterans, they were able to mobilize. Uh, uh, you know, a significant amount of the population. How what? Yes. Was that a function just of everyone having a shared resentment or was there a plan to build cross, um, you know, uh, intra-union uh, solidarity or was it because they were immigrants or what was that? Well, the, 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 there were a number of things I would say. However, one of the key elements that kind of glued together that class solidarity 
was a lot of these immigrants came from uh, situations in Europe where they had felt oppression. They, you know, they were living under draconian uh, regimes, uh, feudal regimes. So they came to Canada with a couple of expectations. One, they were coming to Canada to build a new country, to build a new nation. And it wasn't just their labor, it was their their uh, tenacity, their courage, their resilience that uh, they knew they were bringing to Canada. Secondly, a lot of these organizations were very, very independent. Uh, these people were very, very independent. So they built their uh, synagogues, they built their labor temples, they built their churches, they uh, set up their community organizations, they started benevolent societies. You know, they were they were not waiting for government. I mean, there was no expectation that government would provide these these services. So there was an ethic right from the beginning of people helping themselves, helping each other. And we can tell many stories of, you know, different ethnic groups that may have been fighting in Europe, but they came to Canada and started working together. There was a, a, a collaboration around issues. So I think that was a, a, a kind of a seminal part of the changes that were taking place. A lot of the social services prior to the 1920s were provided by church groups or by benevolent groups, many of the middle class. Um, and uh, there was a sense of, you know, that it was important to help one's neighbor, to, to help the dis- destitute. I uh, remember there were a lot of widows uh, created from the First World War, and they, they rarely had a, a good alternative income. So there were these women and children that needed support. And because we're um, uh, kind of a smaller country than the States, and our cities were smaller at the time, there, you know, people knew and could see the, the, the conditions that people were living in, and there was that es- effort to respond. So one of the things that's maybe a little different between Canada and the States is that we've had a bit of that social unionism right from the early 1900s. Uh, and so we've pushed through, and whether directly initiated by the unions or initiated by the progressive political parties, with the support of the unions, but we've got a lot of the, you know, socialized medicine, uh, improved educational services, uh, in, um, unemployment insurance, and things like that, and that we've had for you know decades here. So it's a little different, but I, I, I'm really glad you mentioned this in terms of the the unions responding to uh, economic and cultural conditions today, and especially a lot of young people want to get involved in organizing around. Uh, environmental issues and social issues, you know, confronting racism and things like that. And the unions are responding. They are getting on board and and seeing that there is that sense of um, uh, both obligation and benefit when we all work together around these issues. So uh, the strike ends uh, six weeks later, more or less, at least officially, I guess, on what is known as Bloody Saturday. What, What happened on that day? Yeah, that was, um, you know, it was a constructed, uh, spontaneous conflict. Um, the state, uh, the uh, local elite had been planning and tr- trying to figure out ways of confronting the unions. Uh, they uh, were, were ready for a fight. You know, they had uh, special police hired, ready to, uh, uh, to uh, intervene. They had military ready so that uh, when the veterans planned a silent march, a silent demonstration, on June the 21st, uh, and it started out very, very peacefully. About 8,000 people congregated in front of City Hall in downtown Winnipeg, but the authorities were not up for uh, tolerating any of that. They uh, they charged in with uh, horses and clubs, and uh, at one point they even pulled out their revolvers and uh, killed a couple of men, killed two men. So it, it was a, a brutal suppression of the uh, of the of the workers and of the veterans um, and it was like I say they were very clear that it had to be a peaceful violent protest and they were protesting the arrest um, of 10 men that had been arrested just a few days earlier and the raids that took place on three of the labor temples again the state had no authority to make these raids and arrests but they did, and the public was incensed. And so there were demonstrations all across Canada, and the one planned here in Winnipeg you know, on June 21st was the, the, to culminate 
and, and really uh, express the, the, the public's um, uh, criticism of the, of the government and what they had done uh, with these men and with the labor temples. And so what happened in the wake of Bloody Saturday? Well, you know, the workers, I'm sure, you know, not being there, but, you know, from, from the records we had, the workers were obviously disillusioned by then because it seemed that the strike had become very violent. Throughout these six weeks, the unions were constantly saying that the best thing that for the workers to do during the strike, to win, was to do nothing not confront, not uh, uh, challenge, not demonstrate. So when this happened, uh, it demoralized everyone, and the Central Strike Committee then called an end to the strike for June 25th. Now, in a way, the, the interesting uh, uh, echo or wave that came out of that, in the next two years, a number of very progressive and labor-oriented politicians were elected to office in the, in the city government, the provincial government, and the federal government. And uh, just to give you a snapshot, three of the so-called strike leaders that were uh, charged with and convicted of seditious conspiracy, they were in jail in 1920 when they ran for the provincial legislature, and they were elected, overwhelmingly elected, even though they were never allowed out of jail. So, you know, the, 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 the aftermath, really was a, a vote of the people on the strike, and they voted their support for the strike and the, stri- and the strike leaders. Wow. Um, and, and so f- following that, like, what were the, I guess, the, I guess, you know, then the echoes and the ripples of, of that strike? Right. I mean, did we see any type of reforms? Um, I'm curious if there was ever any analogous uh, or... Uh, legislation and you know i'm jumping ahead of course taft hartley happened in this country yes. in the uh yep. in the 40s late 40s and that um ultimately i think yep. has really undercut the power of unions and you know i think people are working on trying to figure out ways in which to um uh, to rebuild that union power but it uh, the, the the worst thing about taft hartley in terms of power is it really prevented um general strikes and uh, of this ilk. But uh, was there anything equivalent to that in Canada? And to the extent that there was or wasn't, was there also any other sort of ripple effects of this uh, strike? Well, a couple of things. First of all, um, right after the strike in the 1920s, it was um, um, a, a period for the economy where there wasn't the same kind of growth that preceded the 1920s. So that was the first thing. And then by 1929-30, then there was the Depression that put a cap on a lot of economic development and change. So, you know, things that had um, uh, kind of national uh, dimensions to them that had nothing to do with the strike were, were really dominant at the time. However, uh, the unions, there w- it was a setback for the unions because workers uh, were disappointed in the failure of the strike. And so there, there was a time when the unions had to build back their credibility and, and uh, their, their, their strength. But the significant thing, one of the significant things that came out of the strike was that the living conditions that the workers had experienced and were experiencing was really exposed. And in Canada, we have something called royal commissions. That's when a government uh, is, gets uh, high-powered, uh, credible people to do an investigation, to do an analysis of a, an, an important issue. And so in Canada, there was a federal royal commission and then a provincial royal commission to look into what were the underlying causes of the labor unrest and the Winnipeg strike. And both of these clearly pointed out that it was, uh, you know, the workers were frustrated, they were unemployed, they were facing uh, poor working conditions, uh, wages were low. Uh, at the same time, there was a wealthy class that was benefiting from the um, from the, the labor of the workers. You know, So these commissions, and these are very, very elite, government-oriented uh, commissions. Both of them were run by uh, judge, uh, judges. Both of them came out and basically endorsed what the strikers were fighting for. So that didn't lead to immediate social service development, for example. 
but it did put in place and it did show the importance of government and uh, non-governmental agencies working to provide the kind of supports that workers needed, that you can't just expect workers to be slaves. They do have their, their personal lives. And, and by the 1940s and 50s, you saw an awareness that when uh, workers are well-clothed, well-fed, uh, educated, it benefits the economy. It benefits industry and business. So, you know, it took time. Uh, but the strike and the commissions uh, that came out of that so clearly articulated the the living conditions and the exploitation of workers that it did register for the future. I wouldn't say there are direct relations. I'd love to say that something that was uh, done in, during the strike, you know, led to certain legislation. Uh, but there's very few links. I'll give you one example. One of the Strike leaders, a guy named J.S. Woodsworth, became quite famous, and he really, really pushed the Canadian government to institute a pension plan for Canadians, which we now have, and it's a fairly uh, healthy plan, and a lot of Canadians rely on it. Well, you know, he was a strike leader. He was in Parliament in the 1920s and 30s, and it took him a long time and, and other progressive politicians, but they were able to get something very significant that not only benefited unionists, but benefited everyone in the country, all all citizens. So it wasn't direct relationships to what, what happened after, but you can see that there was a that it that the strike was a catalyst in a way that uh, allowed progressive politicians to then move forward and push for a more progressive agenda. That I think is um, a huge huge lesson for folks to take yeah. uh, from this story. And I have to say also, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the, the idea of those elite commissions um, resolving that the strikers were right sounds about the most Canadian thing I could ever imagine in some way. <laughs> but uh, Dennis uh, Lewicki, the book is Magnificent Fight, the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Great to meet you.